I also want to thank the Arnold Salzman Institute for co-sponsoring this lecture series, also the School of International and Public Affairs. Um, thanks to all of them for, for making all this possible. And thank you uh, especially to Bob Jervis for coming tonight and, and, to, and for speaking with us. Um, I think many of you already know uh, Bob Jervis is the Adley Stevenson Professor of International Politics. Uh, he's also been the president of the American Political Science Association. I mean, normally introductions of this kind, you, you'd rattle off all the other kind of impressive titles that, that he's had. But I always think it's more interesting to hear something about you know, why he's had all of these titles. Um, and the reason, uh, I think, was never more apparent than if you were in this room last Friday. Uh, this room was filled um, with Bob Jervis's students, uh, his former students, uh, his peers in the profession, not just political science, but history. Um, he also even had a, a former teacher of his, um, Thomas Schelling, the Nobel laureate. Um, and this was on the occasion of um, you know, marking the, his achievement, his many achievements, his many contributions. Um, it's the kind of honor that uh, very few professors are ever lucky enough to, to, uh, to receive. And this one, uh, this conference uh, in his honor was, I think, even more than usually on such occasions, more than usually filled with, uh, with respect and affection um, for Bob and his, uh, his many contributions, not just to the field, but to the careers of these particular um, scholars, and in some cases, practitioners as well. A number of them had gone on to work in, uh, in U.S. foreign policy. Um, now, I think also striking was the many different fields that were represented. Um, they had divided up this conference into the different fields that Bob Jervis has, has contributed to. Um, so it began with international relations theory. Um, they went on to talk about political psychology, um, nuclear strategy, intelligence analysis. Um, and Bob, as, as was apparent uh, through the day, had made uh, the most fundamental contributions in all these fields. Now, for a scholar to contribute to just one field uh, would have been enough um, to be proud, you know, and to feel that they had really accomplished something. So it was, it was really quite amazing, and still is amazing, just to think of all the ways, all these different ways in which Bob Jervis has, uh, has contributed um, to political science, um, to the way political scientists try to explain the world, but beyond political science, um, to the way, in my own discipline, the way historians uh, try to narrate um, the world. Um, and explain world politics in their own way. Um, and finally, let me just point out, and I, I think this is something he'll be speaking to tonight as well, Bob Jervis has also contributed in efforts to improve American foreign policy uh, and explain some of the failings in American foreign policy and especially American intelligence. Um, so he's done this uh, with the utmost integrity, so much so that some of what he's said has been ignored, unfortunately. <laughs> But, uh, but nonetheless, it's well worth uh, paying attention to. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm expecting that tonight in talking about North Korea and Iran, he'll, he'll be sharing some of these insights that he's had about American intelligence. Um, but I think that if you think of all the different ways that he's made contributions, international relations theory, uh, nuclear strategy, political psychology, um, and, uh, and so on, I think it's, you'd be hard pressed to imagine anyone who's in a better position uh, to comment on the current challenges to American foreign policy and these two particular countries in particular. Um, so with that, I, I'd like to welcome Bob Jervis and thank him for, for appearing here tonight. Thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you, Matt. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to be here. Um, in some ways, the question of nuclear weapons, both in the Cold War and now, do bring together a lot of uh, the interests that, uh, of mine that Matt talks about. In fact, I, being born in 1940, some of my first uh, political memories deal with nuclear weapons and new and strange things, and I've been puzzling about them ever since. What I want to do is talk about nuclear weapons in the Cold War in two somewhat different ways, and then the carryover to Iran and North Korea. That um, I want to start by talking about, if you will, the 
historiography of nuclear weapons and the Cold War. That is not the history itself, but how he's conceived of the history. And that sort of seems esoteric, especially if you're not a history PhD student, but actually it's important for how we, in many senses of the word, we think about these uh, problems. And it reveals, I think, something about the debates on what to do about or toward Iran and North Korea and why those debates are, are very difficult. And just the first thing to note in this context is I'm talking about uh, nuclear weapons and the Cold War for the first part of my talk. And that's an intersection and one question that's fascinating and contested and I'm not going to get into much is the relationship between the two. You could imagine a world of which nuclear weapons but no Cold War and certainly imagine a counterfactual history of Soviet American rivalry without nuclear weapons. More broadly, historians and political scientists differ on how, we, not only on, on exactly what role nuclear weapons played in the Cold War, did they stabilize it, destabilize it, I'll talk about that later, but how central to the Cold War were nuclear weapons? And we often run them together, but actually saying how important nuclear weapons were to the Cold War, or to turn that around, how important the Cold War was to the way we have come to think about nuclear weapons really are quite, you know, is not easy to say. And I know for those of you who are in the Hertog program, which I think is a marvelous opportunity for those of, not only for you and for those of us who we come to you to talk about it, uh, you know, it, it isn't quite, as clear as it would seem at the outset because I think we think of them together. But remember, nuclear weapons were developed, at least in the U.S., before there was a lot of thought about the Cold War. Now there's a big debate about whether the dropping of the bombs was related to an attempt to intimidate the Soviet Union. I think the answer is largely no. Uh, my good friend uh, Campbell Craig and his co-author Redchenko make the in really ingenious argument that the Hiroshima bomb was not related to the Soviet Union and the Nagasaki was. It's ingenious, as I've told uh, Campbell. I think it's wrong, uh, but it, you know, it is ingenious. The whole book, the whole book is ingenious and I think wrong. But um, you know, at least the bombs developed without the Cold War. I think we would have had nuclear weapons in the absence of the Cold War eventually. Uh, and the Soviet-American rivalry, I think, would have existed without nuclear weapons. Might have taken quite a different form, come back whether it would have been more dangerous. But anyway, uh, the point is the two are logically separable. And empirically, when you look at a lot of things, and ask the question, well, what role did nuclear weapons play in this crisis and that crisis and that general outlook? It is not, it's not clear. And it's a very interesting question that has really, I think, not been discussed a great deal. But with, I'm gonna set that aside. I am gonna look at that part of nuclear weapons. I'm gonna talk by talking about as well the historiography, which is uh, mapping the terrain of how historians and political scientists have looked at nuclear weapons in the Cold War. And I want to make, uh, let's see how many points I have. Four basic points, uh, starting with the fact that I mentioned uh, to the first meeting of the Hertog group, the perhaps surprising degree of continuity between uh, continuity first of views about uh, nuclear weapons during the Cold War and then even more surprising the carryover in views at least of American analysts about nuclear weapons during the Cold War and their views about Iran and North Korea today. That uh, Right from the start, that is really the fall of 1945, that is month, the month after the bomb was dropped, 
people were started thinking about nuclear weapons. And what's fascinating I talk about in the first chapter of my Nuclear Revolution book <coughs> is that almost immediately people staked out two positions that really continued like a, was really a red thread through the rest of the Cold War. Some people, uh, best epitomized by a, my late colleague and was a, a friend of mine, Bernard Brody, argued that nuclear weapons were constitute a revolution in statecraft because of their enormous destructive capability and the fact that when countries got a certain number of nuclear weapons, getting more wouldn't matter a lot. Other scholars, or other people, he was the person who developed this first in 46, was not a scholar, but someone named William Borden, who those of you who really know the details of American nuclear history will know Borden as the key staff member of the Joint Congressional Committee on Atomic Energy, who led the move to increase American uh, reprocessing and enrichment facilities in 1949 and 50, and who led the move to uh, deny, to lift the security clearances of J. Robert Oppenheimer. Fascinating character. I think Mace, I think is still alive. I'm not positive. I think Matt is a historian. You must know all these. I think he's alive. He was at least a few years ago. Played a very anyway. Borden argued, no, this isn't right. Nuclear weapons are weapons like any other weapon. Yes, they are enormously destructive. They're to be taken seriously, but uh, they don't turn things on their head. That is, they're not revolutionary. And um, as the Cold War proceeded, it isn't as though all the scholars, let alone all the decision makers, went back and uh, thumbed the, uh, the absolute weapon that Brody's essays appeared in, or There Will Be No Time, the more dramatic title of Borden's book. Most of them, even the scholars, were unaware. Well, they weren't aware of Borden. They, they knew of uh, uh, the Brody essays. They became famous. But decision makers, of course, didn't. But they recapitulated these views with obviously lots of permutations. I think this is quite interesting because you know it isn't only that it, that it tells us, oh well, people reinvent the wheel, they could have saved their time rereading those two books, that is partly true, but it tells something either about objective reality or about habits of at least the American minds, and which is which of those is right is rather hard to tell. Uh, because people kept coming back to these two as different foundational ideas. It would be interesting, by the way, to see, to know more about what people in other countries thought. The problem is, there, you know, other scho scholars in other countries never looked at it as carefully when the scholars in Soviet Union obviously couldn't. Scholars in Britain and you know, other West European countries could, but you know, they, there weren't as many of them, and they were influenced by the American debate. So we don't have as much of a good test of whether this was sort of a universal of looking at it in these two ways or whether something peculiarly American here. But anyway, um, they, uh, this leads to some specifics that I'll get into in the second half, but the interesting point for the historiography is the relative lack of change throughout the Cold War and into the post-Cold War period. Now, I say relative lack. I don't, can't go into detail. People did change. I mean, McNamara's views, for instance, changed. A number of people's views did change somewhat. But, but people uh, did tend to see the world in one way or another. And then what's particularly interesting is that after the Cold War, you find the continuity continuing, and continuing in two senses. First, people's views do not change radically with the end of the Cold War. And the way that's surprising, because the end of the Cold War brought us, over time, an enormous number of Western documents, especially on the US side, a large number, not nearly as many, on the Soviet side, and some on China as well. 
And you know, the history just could be written, not in a final way, but with much better documentation. And what you find, which this links to my view in political psychology, is you find in documents what you expect to find, partly. <clears throat> so people read the same documents, but they don't read them the same way. Uh, if I had more time, we could talk about what historians and political scientists have changed and why. I think that's fascinating, and, and not only at the level of gossip, but you know, I'm going to put that aside. I'm just going to make the point of basic continuity, which I think is, is correct. Uh, yeah, it may indicate we're never going to settle these views. Now, there are always going to be legitimate differences about the role nuclear weapons played in this. And that it's not only related to the fact, although it is partly related to the fact that many of those writing about the Cold War period now live through it and took positions either as decision makers or myself as scholars at the time. Uh, but I think it isn't only that. I think that even people coming to it anew tend to cluster around some of the same questions and come up with their answers. And then as we'll see, well, um, let me just do this now, that, that there is high continuity, not complete, but high. And the people who are hawks, and I'll use the terms hawks and doves, yes, they're very simple-minded, but they, you know, they carry us pretty far. You know, I only have 50 minutes. If we had three hours, we'd break it down, but let's just use the terms hawks and doves. Um, and then if we want, we can qualify them. But anyway, people who are hawks in the Soviet, uh, hawks in the Cold War, tend to be hawks about Iran and North Korea. Hawks in a, in a dual but related sense in that they tend, to, or really a triple sense, first they think these countries are really reaching for nuclear weapons. Second, they think if these countries get nuclear weapons, or in the case of North Korea, grow the stockpile, this will lead to really bad things for the U.S. And Hawks third, and that they think the way we have to deal with this is with not necessarily force, though some think that's not an illegitimate position, but at least by tough bargaining things. People who were doves in the Cold War, who tended to think that this conflict escalated more than it needed to through an arms race that it was partly a spiral based on the security dilemma, that is each side inadvertently making the other side insecure, uh, that we didn't need more than second strike capability, uh, that these people tend to believe uh, that these country, Iran, may not really be going for a full nuclear ca capability, uh, believe that these countries are motivated more by security than aggression, and that the consequences of these countries getting nuclear weapons are not so bad. Full disclosure, I am now, although was not always, uh, more in the dove camp on this, both less on the Cold War where, as uh, Frank Gavin has pointed out, I really have been quite ambivalent and have moved back and forth, but I am with some ambivalence in, in the dove camp <coughs> on Iran and North Korea. On that point, just one of them. Let me just say, I know conser conservatives especially believe that terrible problem that the university world is all on the left, and so we brainwash our students. I'd say the, la the first statement is largely true. On the second statement, I just want to make two points. No one who has ev ever read student exams can think we brainwash our students. <laughs> Those of you who are TAs, right? <laughs> Uh, and this is relevant because I've spent some time during the Bush administration and now arguing with my former students in the government that we're following an incorrect policy. These are very, very smart people. I uh, admire their work enormously. I'm proud that I played some role in their careers, and they're wrong. <laughs> so clearly, if I'd, my attempt to brainwash them has not succeeded. But anyway, the main point is you get this Continuity in spite of the fact that, you say the Cold War continuity, in spite of the in large flow of documents, and the post-Cold War continuity, in spite of the fact that uh, the situations are, and the actors are wildly different. 
Um, an implication of this uh, is that persuasion is really difficult. And this is true, I think. Scholarly persuasion and political persuasion does occur. I don't want to say it's not there. But it is very difficult, especially among people who look at things seriously. Uh, that evidence is always ambiguous and that we're not going to settle these questions once and for all. One, and that we will find these continuities in people and policies, but, but immediately there is one puzzle that I really can't answer, maybe you want to come back from the question to answer, that uh, the Obama policy toward nuclear weapons is represented by the Nuclear Posture Review if you, and the uh, New START Treaty with Russia is fairly consistent with his uh, campaign uh, position he seems to develop before. The policy toward Iran and North Korea is less consistent. And we can talk about why there's, I don't have, a, I have some speculation, don't have a good answer. Third point on the um, sort of the historiography is that um, the current world affects the past you know, as well as vice versa. Um, I think there's a lot, you know, they say that there is a carryover of views from the Cold War to the current, but my guess is for some people coming into this anew, for if you will, the younger generations, that their views on current issues will affect their reading of the Cold War. That is, if you look at people, with scholars or government analysts, say, who were just 30 or so, that is, people who were too young to have been really deeply affected by the Cold War. Where, but when I, my guess <clears throat> is that the views they adopt on the Cold War will be strongly influenced by their views of the current uh, situations and their current uh, policy preferences. This is not new. I think we see this all the time. There's a marvelous book by a historian named Gerald Combs. I think the, it's got a very bland title. I think it's like American Foreign Policy or something. It's, but what it's about, I mean, you think, who would want to, you know, is this just a textbook? No, it's very different. He looks at the interpretations of crucial elements in American history of American foreign relations. The Revolution, the War of 1812, foreign policy surrounding the Civil War, the Spanish-American War, World War I. And then what he does, what's innovative, is he looks at the views that were held at various generations of scholars. And he argues, I think it really shows, that the interpretations of events 50, even 100 years earlier, are, were very influenced by the debates that were current when people were writing. And so the interpretations, say, of the War of 1812 that were written in 1920 were strongly influenced by the debates about the First World War. In a way, you'd say, this shouldn't happen as historians. You know, we're studying the past. You know, that, that, that the decision makers in, in 1820 11 and 12 were not influenced by you know, my, uh, so unconditional submarine warfare and other things. But, you know, that isn't the way our minds work. You know, that, that even historians deeply immersed in the past are reading the, today's newspapers. And uh, we have to take this into account. The final point on the historiography is the influences that go the other way that the past and interpretations of the past influence where we are now. One, uh, some general thing in the specifics, in general, say I think the views of people who lived through the Cold War, that were developed in the Cold War, induce mindsets that are carried over. Uh, those people, for instance, who believe that the West, quote, won 
close quotes, the Cold War through a very real assertive position, believe that that's likely to work with Iran and North Korea. You know, those who doubt that and talk about what they believe, and I think correctly, the number of ways in which Reagan was actually fairly conciliatory and that that enabled the Cold War to end. Those people will say, wait a minute, let's look at conciliation in Iran and North Korea. It comes up in, in more specific ways. Sometimes can be helpful. I guess we see or I note the more pernicious examples more. Uh, Richard Nixon and, and others who served in the early Eisenhower administration sincerely believed that American nuclear threats were very important in ending the Korean War. Histo no historian believes that. Uh, the question of were they, the debate ranges between the view that they were totally unimportant and the view that they were marginally helpful. That's where the historical debate is. But Nixon and others believed they were really very important. This, I believe, helps explain the, his behavior in Vietnam. He didn't make explicit nuclear threats, but as of you know the period, understand, he did various things that attempted to show that he, that he might use nuclear weapons, that he was not completely you know, in control of things and, and various things. Uh, similarly, I believe you know, his nuclear strategy, which I think was not really crucial to him, was affected by his view that, uh, that American nuclear advantage had been very helpful to Eisenhower. Not a view, I believe, that President Eisenhower shared. Naftali and Fursenko, in their book, argue that Khrushchev believed that Soviet nuclear threats were very important in getting Britain and France to halt the attack in Suez and were important <coughs> in protecting Iraq two years later. No historian believes either of those things, uh, but if we're to understand Khrushchev's behavior, it's important to understand the lessons that, that he drew. It would be interesting to know how Iran and North Korea read the nuclear history of the Cold War. Uh, you know, granted that countries pay most attention to the things that affect them most, so Iran presumably pays less attention here than North Korea. North Korea, of course, was the uh, target of American nuclear threats. They knew later, if not at the time, about the threat in 53 and there have been other threats more implicit. Uh, I don't know, I doubt, given the small size, there's a large community of Cold War scholars, at least dealing with Soviet-American relations in North Korea. But, you know, it's an important, very important background for them, and the lessons they drew will, would be important. Um, all right, let me now turn first to the history, now to the uh, history of the Cold War and to the implications for Iran and Iraq, and I'll, I'll take about uh, 10 or 12 minutes on each and then stop. Um, I have questions more than answers, certainly uh, no answers I consider fully proved, but I will try when I do have an opinion to give them, but I do think that, the, you know, I do want to highlight the, the questions. The first is an implicit <coughs> question that people, implicit, I mean, people haven't written about it as much as they might, and yet I think it's really in the background a lot of things, but it's so much in the background, I really didn't think about it until a couple of days ago. This is how dangerous was the Cold War? How close did we come to nuclear war? This is important partly in the Iran-Iraq case and also in our attitudes toward nuclear pairs like uh, India and Pakistan. Because, uh, and, and the, the, the basic question is, and it's related to another all raises, 
uh, how close did we come to war? And the way I like to think about it is, uh, were, you know, were we lucky? Were we playing Russian roulette? And you know, if you play, you know, if there are enough barrels in the gun, and if we only look, say, at crises and not every, you know, take every day as separate, we look at new uh, crises that were got really serious, we could say there were a handful, I, you know, quibble how many, but let's just say 10. You know, well, we didn't have nuclear war. Does that mean, you know, we spun, you know, there were a large number of barrels in the gun, and, you know, we spun it and we got lucky, and if we'd done it another 20 times, we probably would have had a different result. Or does the fact that we avoided nuclear war at all turn mean that really this was fairly safe, partly safe because people believed it was unsafe. I, you know, it's a very hard question and it's just on many levels. One is in retrospect how safe it was, another is how safe did people think it was and then related to that what I alluded to before, how do beliefs play into the interaction. Um, it isn't even entirely clear what we mean by how safe it was or how close did we come to war. You know, what does close mean? I think what it means is if we close our eyes and imagine a hi different history, you know, counterfactuals, tweaking small things, would you have gotten war? You know, not you know, making enormous change, making plausible changes. If Nixon had been elected in 1960 and Khrushchev had put missiles in Cuba, now you might say, wait a minute, if Nixon had been elected, Khrushchev wouldn't have put missiles in Cuba. You know, not crazy, or say, anyway, but let me just assume that he would. Would we have had nuclear war? You know, that's <clears throat> if Kennedy had had a slightly different outlook. If there had been a news leak on the second day, which, you know, not unlikely, would have happened if we rerun the history today, uh, because as you know, if you know the history of the crisis, the first couple of days they were tending toward an airstrike. Doesn't mean that would have triggered nuclear war, but you know, it would have been something different. Um, another way is sort of, again, just thinking of more crises. Let's say there'd been another six or seven crises, how likely would we have had it? It's, um, I think, uh, you know, one goes almost by, by gut instinct, and I admit uh, I go back and forth on this. Um, I think it was more than luck. We did have a pretty long run of history. But as we know, just looking at the uh, Gulf of Mexico, you know, having a pretty Long, long string of cases where you don't have an oil blowout doesn't mean you never will. In the same way, having that long string of not war not new, doesn't mean that you never were close to war. One thing, you, you know, and you can also, again, on people's beliefs, uh, you can look at some of what people said, especially in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah, there are problems with that if you want we can get in question. Um, the fact that it is so hard, I think it gives more room for people's ideologies in influencing the answer they give. And I don't mean ideologies pejoratively. Uh, people who believe in, uh, who worry a lot about nuclear spread tend to believe we were lucky. Uh, people who believe similarly, who worry a lot about, I think, North Korea and Iran in particular say we were lucky, and I'll come back to one part of that. Uh, so people who were more relaxed about, at least in retrospect on the Cold War, tend to either favor proliferation, and even Ken Waltz, who's written the famous book, and it doesn't really favor it, he just says, wouldn't be as bad as you think, tend to be more relaxed here. Um, a related question is, did nuclear weapons uh, help stabilize the Cold War? Um, 
did they reduce the chances of war or not? And this is, again, a very hard question because it's partly counterfactual. <clears throat> what we'd, even a political scientist who believes in the comparative method would say, well, we could compare nuclear with non-nuclear worlds. And we can say there are a lot more wars in non-nuclear worlds. We can do this two ways. We can look at the history of the world before of superpower relations, rather, great power relations before 1945 and after 1945. You know, the world after 45 is bloody, but the great powers, in this case, the Soviet Union and U.S. don't fight each other. Before that, you get a lot of wars among great powers. I, th I think that statement is true, and I think this is one of the things that leads me to think on balance nuclear weapons do sta did stabilize the Cold War. Although uh, there were ways in which it destabilized it as well. <clears throat> but I think the fact that most sensible decision makers and all of them had this degree of being sensible realized what an utter catastrophe World War uh, would be meant that they were conscious to stay far from the brink even during crises. It also meant in a way in which beliefs can affect behavior that you got uh, self-denying prophecies. After a while, due to various party academic or government and academic studies, most people in the U.S., not so much in the Soviet Union, came to believe the greatest danger was what we call crisis instability, what Tom Schelling called the reciprocal fear of surprise attack. That is a belief that what was really dangerous was crisis instability. What was really dangerous was if you had a crisis and either or even worse, both sides believed that striking first would bring enormous advantages. Then even states that wanted to avoid war would fight because they would see that whoever struck first could win the war and whoever waited could be destroyed. That view, whether it's right or wrong, is debatable, led, really drove a fair amount of American defense policy from the late 50s on. It led the U.S. to do various things to make sure its retaliatory force was secure and to uh, do things to minimize, not entirely to zero, but to minimize the degree to which it threatened the Soviet retaliatory force. And I think those stabilizing factors were important in crises in both reducing the number and in making them less dangerous than they otherwise would be. Uh, and this, but note, this view doesn't really explain why there was no war before the Soviets had second strike retaliatory capability. The Soviets did not get this till we can debate whether it's 1961 or 1964. The difference is partly how you read Soviet uh, uh, submarine launched forces. But there's a long period when the Soviets don't have second strike capability and yet as my colleague Dick Betts has shown in his book on nuclear blackmail, the US decision makers act as though the Soviet Union does have second strike capability which is sort of a puzzle. But nevertheless there is a significant period before this including of course the famous period of the American nuclear monopoly and the view I've just given won't explain why the U.S. didn't launch a preventive war, which, as Mark Trachtenberg has shown, American decision makers did give serious thought to. But I do think in, in many ways nuclear weapons were stabilizing, but they were not entirely stabilizing, as of Frank Gavin points this out in the recent IS article. First, uh, the very fact that war, the, the, the total destruction, the destruction of nuclear war, led war to be something everyone in power thought about all the time. 
That couldn't help but heighten tensions, even if you were pretty confident of peace. It also meant you were constantly worried on the other side getting a usable advantage, even if you were not sure what usable advantage meant. And it also meant you tended to give not worst case analysis, but to worry quite a bit about worst case and to do some things to take, uh, to try to counteract that. It did mean there, it did feed to some extent an arms race, a lot of debates about whether there really was an arms race and we could come back to that. But it certainly gave a general tension to the relationship. Another way in which nuclear weapons made the situation, affected the situation, I don't want to say destabilized it, was it led to a general concern, if not preoccupation, with domino effects, credibility, and reputation. And these three things are linked. And I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to go into that more, except <clears throat> say that if you think, because nuclear weapons war is disastrous, it means it's hard to make the threat to go to nuclear war credible. That means you have to say and do a lot of things to increase the credibility. That increases your concern with domino effects of various kinds. It increases your desire to look tough because that's what protects you. We argue, I mean, uh, of course, the Munich analogy did play a large role here as well. Um, but, uh, and other things, the very bipolarity increased the stress on credibility and domino. Nevertheless, you know, question, would we have had Vietnam without nuclear weapons, which is the shortcut to that, is an interesting question. Third question, and I now want to move quickly, is one I'm just going to raise, not answer, but, but people, it's related to the nuclear revolution, but it, it cuts it a little differently. Whether nuclear weapons really are very special, category by themselves, or whether they should be available for use as any other weapon is, to quote Eisenhower in the... And people, I think, minds just somehow shifted often, especially decision makers, without their fully focusing on it. Sometimes they saw them as a weapon and sometimes they said, no, these are very, very different. The final question in, uh, that we confront in Cold War history, and then I'll come to the relevance for today, is encapsulate some of these. What do nuclear, what do you get with nuclear weapons? What do they bring states? Uh, one thing may be status. Uh, and I do think we tend to underestimate the role of status and standing in world politics. And Ned LeBeau has a recent mammoth book that I think goes a little too far on the other side, but, but I think the we do underestimate. You look at the British decision to get nuclear weapons uh, when, during and after the war, and it was really mostly, well, we're a great power. Great powers have the best weapons available. Nuclear weapons are the best pay, power, weapons available. Ergo, you know, it really wasn't more analysis than that. I think uh, the French desire to get nuclear weapons, I think, was less because they were afraid the U.S. wouldn't protect them, and more they knew the U.S. had no choice but to protect them, and so they could stick it in the American eye by trying to increase their status by getting nuclear weapons. Um, but clearly, uh, one reason nuclear powers wanted it was for deterrence. The basic idea articulated most fully by Waltz in the, non, in the proliferation that nuclear weapons may not be good for a lot of things, but they're good for deterrence. No one is going to attack us if we have nuclear weapons. I need to flag another issue here because it will come up again in, in the Iran and North Korea, and that is not only the question, the question of deterring attacks on your homeland, but also extended deterrence. That is, do they um, protect against threats against your allies? Something Britain and France and today, say, India and Pakistan don't really face, but the U.S. really faced because the heart of a lot of the debates in the Cold War on nuclear strategy came down to what makes extended deterrence 
credible. What, may, what would make it credible that the U.S. would uh, do the first use of nuclear weapons because it could not contain a conventional Soviet invasion of Western Europe. I think when we look at what nuclear weapons could do and look at the history, and here I'm just going to give my conclusion without the evidence because I'm you know, past time, and the evidence is as usual ambiguous, I think it bears out what theorists like Tom Schelling said and then I elaborated on, and that is <clears throat> that if you look at the history of the Cold War, nuclear weapons are better for com deterrence than compellence. That is, they're better at keeping the status quo, at convincing the other side not to do various adventures than they are to making changes in the status quo that you want. They're in that sense much more defensive than offensive. It's easier to make the threats uh, to react with nuclear weapons to protect what you have and to protect your allies than it is to threaten to use nuclear weapons unless the other side retracts its position. This is something we debated a lot in the Cold War because the Hawks said the American threats of extended deterrence are incredible. Kissinger, when he left office, said Time and time again, I stood up before the Europeans and said we'd protect them. How could they believe that silly thing? You know, of course we couldn't. First, this was irresponsible. Kissinger said this during the Cold War. It was, you know, it was really uh, not a helpful thing to say, whether it was true or not. Uh, but luckily, I don't think the Europeans took him seriously then or later. So we were safe, but it is, was a big debate. The, the, the Hawks said we have to do all these things to bolster not our direct uh, credibility, but the credibility of extended deterrence. Dove said, for reasons I take me afield, but it's in the, my book on uh, nuclear revolution, that really extended deterrence is quite robust. You know, those, the evidence, again, ambiguous, partly counterfactuals, back to the question how close we came to nuclear war. <clears throat> I think when we look back, certainly at situations that were crises or where there were explicit threats, we find nuclear weapons much more helpful for the defense and the offense. Just one case I'll mention, the extended Berlin crisis from uh, 58 to, well, people debate when it ended, uh, uh, but let's say 62, Khrushchev tried to use the threat of nuclear war to lever, as a lever to get the U.S. out of Berlin. In fact, he did convince Kennedy to be ready to make lots of concessions. We know this from the documents. Kennedy did not have to make those concessions, interesting enough, but he was ready to make a lot of them if he had to. Khrushchev said, in effect, I'm going to do things that will uh, force you to back down or use nuclear weapons. Given that choice, you're going to have to back down. Well, he, in the end, he didn't do it. Why? You could say because he was sensible. He wasn't going to take the first steps that could lead to nuclear war. And it, he would have had to take those steps. And he didn't for good reason. <clears throat> Now, you could say that was just luck. I don't know. Khrushchev was pretty risky, risk prone. And, you know, if it worked with Khrushchev, uh, I don't worry a lot about a Kim Jong il. Of course, maybe we should worry about Kim Jong un, but no one knows anything about him. So, uh, all right. A lot of these debates come up today. And let me take uh, five minutes to talk about them. First, say the surprising continuity. North Korea, uh, you know, and I've said the people who were hawks then are hawks now, partly. Also, North Korea and Iran are different countries in different geopolitical space, and yet uh, I think, at, and, and, the, and in the middle levels of bureaucracy, the people who are doing one are not doing the other, but the highest levels, I think there is a sort of shared outlook about uh, both how bad it will be if these countries get, or in North Korea case, continue to have nuclear weapons, and about what the U.S. can best 
do to avoid that situation. Uh, the Hawks believe that North Korea and Iran both are dedicated on getting to getting nuclear weapons, I mean North Korea has them, and will use them in ways that will harm American interests, or at least there's a large enough probability of that that we have to you know, take that very, very seriously. What will, in other words, they say nuclear weapons can do quite a bit for the country. They say, first of all, why would these countries want nuclear weapons unless they were going to get a lot out of them because it's costing both these countries a lot in money and in you know, international opposition. So that shows they must be strongly motivated. They must think there are really very, very large counterbalancing gains. More specifically, the Hawks say that nuclear weapons will allow these countries to play a much larger role on the world stage. Status can be important here, and just as countries pursue it, it can be in the interest of countries to deny other countries of status. That is, we may not want Iran and North Korea to have high status for you know, obvious reasons. Second, the Hawks believe in that and believe the Cold War shows that uh, nuclear weapons will allow not only status but more concrete gains. Gets back to the question of extended deterrence. No hawk, well, almost no hawk expects an unprovoked attack from North Korea or Iran on the U.S. Uh, first, you know, those countries are a long way from an ICBM. And then, you know, you can say, well, what about putting a, a nuclear weapon in a f freighter and sending it into an American harbor? You know, that's technologically much easier. Uh, but even if you do that, I mean, the, the people, well, why would they do that? <laughs> that, you know, you, that really isn't the main argument. The main argument is that if they have nuclear weapons, they will un reduce or undercut American extended deterrence. The American ability to project force and protect its allies in the regions will be much less that uh, our ability to protect you know, China, uh, excuse me, uh, not, uh, Japan most obviously will be reduced. Uh, it's hard to see who else North Korea might threaten. There also is some fear of giving the, or selling the, the nuclear weapons to non-state actors. I, I think that is really a secondary concern, but it doesn't fit my scheme of things, so I'm going to put it aside. But certainly the concern uh, of uh, intimidating uh, Japan and, of course, South Korea. The argument is partly the Kim, uh, the Kim Jong Il regime really still wants to rule all of Korea. They did try once. Uh, they think that this will allow them to intimidate South Korea. I don't think anyone thinks that they would then use this as a shield behind which they could launch a conventional attack because their forces, although numerous, are not good but that it would allow intimidation. The argument in uh, Iran is obviously the same with various wrinkles. Uh, the obvious wrinkles are here, non-state actors. That is, would Iran provide nuclear weapons for Hezbollah and Hamas? Usually here the answer for Hawks is no but they would embolden not only Iran, but Hezbollah and Hamas, <coughs> even if Iran didn't intend that. First, Iran probably would intend that, but even if they didn't, Hamas and Hezbollah would then be in a position to take tougher actions and go to Iran and say, well, you're going to protect us, right? Or you know, you've got the nuclear weapons, you know, so you know, we're assuming that uh, they're playing some role. 
and Hezbollah and Hamas might might believe this. So even if Iran were not emboldened, others would be. Um, I think uh, part of what drives, first, you know, these, I mean, I've argued this with friends in the academy and in the in two administrations. Obviously, it, it's, there's no proof. I think it is the same argument we've had in the Cold War and somewhat, I say, continuity in, in people's views. Let me just sharpen it with the specifics and then I'll... I'll stop. Uh, that, if you look at the, well, crisis is too strong a word, but tension now in Korea, growing out of the North Korean sinking of the the, the Chonan, that you know, the South Korean Corvette. I mean, I assume that North Korea did sink it. I doubt if it was the Tooth Fairy. Um, and <clears throat> there are two arguments that come up. One general about views of confrontations related to nuclear weapons and second nuclear weapons themselves. The first is what is the motive? Are we in an action reaction cycle? Uh, people who think that uh, um, we are, the doves, say look what happened before Chonan. You've got to go back, and I can't go through the history with you in detail, but anyway, they've been in, with the elections in South Korea, there'd been a hardline government come to power. New government had renounced some of the agreements, taken a very tough position with South Korea, so the North Koreans are responding to the South Koreans. The Hawks say that isn't what's going on. What's going on are things internal to North Korea, some related to the a succession, not the struggle, there is no struggle for succession, but the maneuverings and various aspects of, of the succession, and uh, is also related to the fact that North Korea has now nuclear weapons. It's emboldened that the strong position North Korea would not have done this had it not had nuclear weapons. Um, when we look at Iran, Jimmy, I'm, uh, my response as a dove is if we didn't, if we just look at North Korean behavior and we don't know that it has nuclear weapons, so we can't look at the two nuclear tests, obviously. We look at their external behavior. Can we see a big change when they you know, have nuclear weapons and increase their stockpile? My answer is no. I just don't think there's a big change. The Hawks disagree on that. You can't prove it, but I think that's a question. On the Iranian case, there are a lot of important details. I just flag two or three dealing with intelligence and then give the basic question, and then I'll stop. Um, the, a number of questions. Yeah, how good can our intelligence be on Iran? As you know, if you followed it at all, we you know we know a fair amount, partly thanks to the IAE inspectors being at Natanz. What we don't know is whether they're secret sites, that is, whether they are doing uh, enrichment anywhere else. We also don't know much about the plutonium separation. We know they're building a power reactor, a reactor that will produce plutonium that they don't really need but we don't know if they have other secret things. The secret sites are particularly important because you've read that Iran has now enough LEU, low enriched uranium, to make one or two bombs. Yes, that's true, but you can't make a bomb out of low enriched uranium. You have to make it out of highly enriched uranium. Producing highly enriched uranium is not just a matter of running the same stuff through the reactor, through the enrichment facilities at Natanz as they're currently configured. To do this with any efficiency, you have to shut the plant down, re-plummet in a way that would take months. How many? Hard to tell. At least four, maybe more, to produce highly enriched uranium. And that would give the world, including Israel, which of course is crucial since I think Israel will bomb 
rather than allow Iran to get nuclear weapons. I'm not saying they should. I'm just saying they, I think they will. That gives a lot of what we call timely warning. We would be a lot of time. But that's only true if there are no secret sites. If there are secret sites where they're doing both low enriched uranium and highly enriched, or they are somehow smuggling some of the stockpile from Natanz to the sites where they're doing highly enriched uranium, then we could be taken by surprise in a way that would be nasty. <clears throat> And this is an extraordinarily difficult intelligence problem. But the basic question of where I want to close is what nuclear weapons, what they would get Iran. And obviously, we don't know. Even if I'm true, even if my argument that weapons haven't gotten North Korea a lot, it wouldn't necessarily mean that this would be true for Iran. People who argue that it drastically undercuts American extended deterrence, I think, I mean, I meet that argument with two counter arguments uh, that are related. First, uh, this really paints American uh, deterrence as really very weak. And when you work through the logic, I have trouble with this. I've written about this in detail in my American chapter that was in the European Journal of IR in the spring of 2003 in a chapter in my American foreign policy in a new era when I talked about how I believe that even if Saddam had nuclear weapons and I thought I believed the intelligence I thought he was getting them that he could be deterred uh, and I think that argument holds for Iran as well and I go through some fairly intricate deterrence you know he thinks that I think things and I, I won't do that because it's already in print uh, say you just substitute Iraq, Iran for Iraq, you know, just change the last letter and you get the basic argument. Uh, but I do want to say first that this argument that, oh my God, if Iran gets nuclear weapons, it's going to be all this dreadful, paints an image of the U.S. as remarkably easy to deter. And I don't find that convincing. I would also ask, and I have asked people involved, and some of them have said this is useful and some have said they've used it, they've put it on briefing slides at some time, so is what is, what is Iran, what are we now deterring Iran from that we couldn't deter them from doing if they had nuclear weapons? Because if you're worried about the nuclear weapons, you're saying that Iran is now, we are now successfully deterring Iran in ways. I'm not sure how long that list is. About, it was a year, 18 months, two years ago or something, Iran sees some British sailors, you know, in the disputed waters off the Shat al Arab. And the Wall Street Journal ran a typical Wall Street Journal editorial saying, oh my God, think what they would, they're doing this, think what they would do if they get nuclear weapons. My reply is, if Iran had done this when they'd had nuclear weapons, the Wall Street Journal would have said, oh my God, they can do this because of nuclear weapons. They never would have done something like that had they not had nuclear weapons. It's not amenable to proof, but it is one of the central questions. Then finally, before I stop, why, if they're not going to be able to push us around, why do they want nuclear weapons? I think they want nuclear weapons partly for status. I think Iran, by the way, is not going to go all the way to nuclear weapons, especially if we handle, if we have the right policies. Not sure they'll do it if they have the wrong policies. But anyway, uh, but why do they want nuclear capability? I think they know as we do what, are the, what I said from the Cold War, nuclear weapons are more useful than, for deterrence than compellence. They live in bad neighborhoods, as you know, the realists put it. And they have been subject to nu threats, in North Korea's case, nuclear threats. They've been subject to threats of regime change. In the Iranian case, they have been subject to uh, regime change. I think it would be hard in both cases to be a decision maker and say, oh well, we're perfectly safe against American attempts to invade or subvert us, if, right? I, I think that would strain credul credulity and also be very susceptible to the argument, hey, 
if we have nuclear weapons, the chances of American invasion are greatly, greatly reduced. The chances of American uh, messing around with our borders, say gross border uh, intrusions, are not dropped to zero, but they're significantly reduced. The chances of the U.S. playing the game, a regime change through subversion don't go to zero, but are greatly reduced. Uh, so I see the base of, basic motive of these countries as more defensive than offensive. There are rebuttals, uh, and I would give them to some of them to you, but I'm out of time, so let me, I've gone on as usual, about 10 minutes longer than I wanted, so let me just stop here for, for questions and comments. Okay. So uh, those who'd like to pose questions, uh, I'd invite you to come to the uh, to the microphone. This is microphone. This is being uh, recorded. So uh, so if you could please come to the microphone. I have a, a I'm question. I'm going to come and sit because okay. <laughs> there's more water over here. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'd, I'd like to pose a question. Um, you know, Bob, one of the things that you're best known for is is your book on the nuclear revolution. Um, I mean, we could talk a bit about, uh, you know, what the implications of your argument are for, you know, countries like Pakistan, North Korea. Um, but, you know, there's a, a question that's been on my mind just more generally about um, um, after the Cold War, you know, where we stand in terms of the nuclear revolution, especially if uh, the U.S. and other countries are reducing their, their arsenals, uh, uh, these weapons are becoming, at least in the, the case of the U.S., increasingly antiquated. Um, now, you know, one basic question would be, uh, what should the goal be? Um, you know, do you, uh, do you, you, you say a lot of nice things about nuclear weapons <laughs> in the nuclear revolution and all the, the, the good they've done in the world, in, in effect. I mean, uh, so, I mean, would you be among those who would say, the, the United States should be working towards a world without nuclear weapons, and even short of that goal, you know, do some of the you know aspects of the nuclear revolution um, come into question when the you know, U.S. and other countries have uh, greatly reduced arsenals? Um, so, so where would yeah. you stand on that? Yeah, um, yeah, uh, no, I am uh, strongly against the well. I have a paradoxical thing. Yes, the U.S. would be much better off if nuclear weapons and knowledge of them disappeared because we have enormous conventional superiority. We can beat up every, anyone we want with two hands tied behind our back, right? I mean, just look at the figures. No one can, can stand up with us. Now, guerrillas, that's different. We can't make Afghanistan a democracy, but you know, we can do what we need to do. So we'd be much better off if there were no nuclear weapons. But I'm strongly against the global zero because you can't get rid of the knowledge of how to make nuclear weapons. Almost 50 years ago, Tom Schelling had an article on this, I think it was in Daedalus, <clears throat> that talks about why this is so dangerous because if you get any crisis, each country worries about the other getting nuclear weapons, and you get back into a version of reciprocal fear of surprise attack. Oh my God, they might be developing it, or thinking of developing it, we better, oh gee, they realize we're thinking that way, so that will redouble their efforts, well it has to redouble our efforts. I think that is, is very dangerous. Uh, so. Uh, and if Obama, when he'd been a student here, had taken my nuclear weapons course, I'm sure he would not have arrived at this position. Most, uh, you know, the gang of four who oppose, <clears throat> who say we should go to zero, we know some of them don't believe it. I don't know if all of them don't believe it, but some of them, uh, I've said in half private, half public things, they don't believe it. Um, I'm happy to say that even the, in the Prague speech and also in the uh, Nuclear Posture Review, Obama has backed away from that. Uh, so uh, how do the levels matter? Yeah, there is a degree at which I would start to get worried. I wouldn't worry. I could, I mean, part of it is you'd have to be able to really go through 
the typical wonky scenario stuff in the way that I used to have to try to do in the Cold War and thank God have given up. But certainly we're well above that number. Um, and I gather we were willing to um, make cuts in some ways. The Russians were willing to go deeper in others. And, and you know, in the end, we couldn't agree and we got the numbers we got now. Um, I don't think the numbers matter a lot, except symbolically, and the symbols aren't trivial. So probably what you want is eventually to trend down a little more, but you don't have to go to a lot. You do have to do two other things. One, just technically, I think you do have to do the stewardship. There's a real technical debate on how safe the stockpile is. I'm totally, first, a lot of it's classified, and while I do classified work, I don't do it in the nuclear era, area. And anyway, it's highly technical. You, could, you, know, you and I could see all the papers <laughs> and not make head or tail out of them. Uh, so I do whatever we all do in this. I listen to the people who I felt convincing in the past, like Dick Garwin, and Dick says not to worry. And when Dick says not to worry, I don't worry. I, I, you know, I believe the stockpile is fine, but I just am taking people's word for it. So, but not only do you have to make the stockpile fine, you have to make sure that military takes the stockpile seriously. And of course, Gates fired, you know, the, the two top people in the Air Force on this thing when they flew the bomber with the cruise missiles on, didn't know they did it. And that's really hard because it used to be nuclear weapons were a fast track in the Air Force. And now, right, if you're dealing with the nuclear weapons, you're a dullard. They're never going to be used. You know, it's what you, what you do for the, uh, uh, the people who are never going to get promoted you know, along and you need somewhere to park them in retirement. And that's a real problem organizationally. How do you <coughs> take this and as seriously as it has to be when in a way you're saying you're never going to use them. That, 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 that's, a real, that's a real challenge. But I do think, say, we have the paradox that we'd be better off without them, but we don't want to move, uh, we don't want to move uh, to zero. Okay. Um, question from Frank Gavin. Yeah. Bob, thanks. That was terrific. And uh, uh, I always learn so much from when I hear you talk. And, uh, reading your stuff, I go back to it, I wrestle with it, and uh, uh, one thing that I was wrestling with, and still wrestling with, and it came out in your talk and comes through in the Nuclear Revolution book, is this a core question of, are nuclear weapons stabilizing or not? And I think you admit it, and I think I feel the same way. It's, you know, I go back and forth on this. But one way that I try to think about it is that maybe it's not the question of their mere existence or who possesses them, but what people decide to do with them. Now, obviously, they're very related. But connected to that, um, I, I think your book, there's the two big arguments that you make. One, that nuclear weapons are essentially stabilizing because they're, they help in a defense-dominant world, they sort of support the status quo, is essentially right for people who use them with those purposes. But when people try to do more with nuclear weapons than, um, than, than that, than the sort of simple, basic deterrence, you get into problems. And where I think that is a real problem, we all think about the coercive uses of it, but I think it's with trying to extend deterrence. And this is where I actually have some difficulty with your book and some of the arguments you make. You say, well, you know, in fact, extended deterrence has very, very low requirements. Uh, the Soviets probably believed we are going to use these things. And this is where I'm not so sure. Because it's very clear to me that even in a non-nuclear world, the, United, the Soviets understood that the United States had a great interest in not being attacked. But of course, we know the Cold War was about the US applying its nuclear umbrella to any number of contingencies, territories, situations that couldn't really remotely be seen as necessarily core interests. And in fact, and that brings up all the questions that we've talked about before about questioning, are, is the U.S. serious? Do they have the resolve? Do they, ha do they have the will? And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, and again, on this in terms of extending deterrence, this is something only the United States really ever does. Do you see anything potentially destabilizing about using nuclear weapons in that extended deterrent way? In the book, in your statement, you said, you know, they're actually, it isn't really problematic. But I'm wondering if, if in fact, there are some places where it could be a problem. 
Yeah, I think it's a very important question. For the Cold War, and it does carry over. Let me come at it a couple of ways. One is to think, say, about a contradiction between my stress on what's on a structural argument and other arguments I made both about misperceptions and on the fact a room for variance by individual decision makers. Um, you know, someone, there's a saying which I usually think is, has a lot of wisdom that the first person to say the word, word Hitler in an argument loses. But, you know, right, the thought experiment, Hitler with nuclear weapons, it's not a, uh, a pleasant thought. You, let's say we're talking, I went to, to Max Raleigh's class, or we, at the end we were talking about uh, Hitler should have stopped after, in 1940. Imagine Hitler with nuclear weapons in 1940, uh, and uh, he certainly could have held on to what he conquered and maybe much more. So uh, it is susceptible to differences in decision makers. The reply is, well, that's true, but Hitler really is a very unusual, thank God. And during the Cold War, we had, I didn't, you know, I, I, how, you know, a certain number of presidents, too late in the day for me to count them, and first secretaries, a fair number, and they didn't, none of them, they all, not, none of them was highly risk-taking, and so that we have some data that people who were fairly different didn't really do crazy things. But that doesn't mean that the next time we roll the barrel in the revolver, we're not going to come up with someone who really doesn't understand. Uh, next part of that, I think, more on, ex well, on the Soviet Union, also in the Cold War. In retrospect, a number of people, including, I think, Condi Rice, have said, oh, well, when justifying the war in Iraq, and in saying, in effect, Saddam would be hard to deter if he had nuclear weapons. And people say, well, you know, we deterred Mao, Stalin, Khrushchev, etc. And she said, yes, but the Soviet Union really was pretty easy to deter. They were actually status quo powers and sensible. Well, when you read, and here's an element, an element of inconsistency, what, what uh, Condi and others were saying in the Cold War, they were not saying that. The Hawks were not saying that the Soviets were, you know, little pussy cats and we didn't have to worry. And God knows, Matt, and you stress this in your IS piece, talk about rogues and, you know, Mao, right? Poster child for roguishness. Um, and so, uh, I'm not sure that, yeah, I do believe that Soviet Union and even Mao's PRC had an enormous stake in the status quo. And that, at least internationally, Mao, you know, we know that you'd met, but, and that was very, very valuable. <clears throat> if you get someone who doesn't, I agree that's harder. Uh, how robust is extended deterrence? Uh, two aspects, and that's very hard. One, the U.S., of course, was deterred quite a bit. I mean, Dulles, of course, as you know, and Eisenhower talked about rollback in the 48 campaign, and we now know, thanks to uh, uh, historians like Greg Mitrovich and others, that even, or especially Truman, was really quite serious about rollback. I mean, if you read Greg's book, Undermining the Kremlin, a couple, uh, and Sarah Cork's new book, I mean, you see there's much more American covert action against so East Europe and Soviet Union than we believed at the time, and that the American decision makers took this more seriously than we believed. But you also see, and it especially comes through in the Cork book, Greg's as well, that, that there were real restraints on this. The um, enormous tension that American decision makers faced was that, oh my God, if covert action really works, it's gonna cause a World War III, and uh, that that Power, that tension comes home as the Soviets get nuclear weapons and then we move even into the hydrogen thing. So the U.S. backs off. So the, and then, of course, it doesn't do anything 
in, in 56 in Hungary and uh, in, 50, in 68 at the Prague Spring. So the U.S. is pretty easy to deter, um, uh, extended deterrence. But I agree it's not clear cut or rather the extended deterrence argument works best when things are clear cut. When you have the nice map of Europe and you know, the Iron Curtain literally running right down the center. And for all the debates, everyone is clear on this is yours and this is ours. There's no ambiguity except in the area that scares people, which is, of course, West Berlin. Everything else, it really is quite clear. Even for Austria, you know, that isn't, it's neutral, it's quite clear you know, that if you go in there, that's changing the status quo. That whole world isn't that way. That's absolutely right. We couldn't use extended deterrence to deter North Vietnam from sending massive conventional force down the Ho Chi Minh Trail uh, even before they had the, for the final invasion in 75. A lot of the story of Vietnam is not a guerrilla war. It is a conventional uh, aspect of conventional war. We tried to deter North Vietnam from doing this. Johnson tried in some ways. Nixon more explicitly, as those of you who know the history know, it's a fascinating story, still very debatable. Um, and furthermore, it's interesting what he says about why we can do it. And I mentioned this uh, last Friday. He says, Johnson couldn't do it. What's the difference between Lyndon Johnson and me? <clears throat> that, he said, Johnson didn't have willpower. I have will in spades. In fact, I think he doesn't, and I think he says it because he's trying to give himself Dutch courage on it. But in any event, let's take him more seriously, and he thinks this is going to work, and it doesn't. It shows, and this brings up the two points you make and I think they're right, or there were three points. First, here's a gray area. There is a line in Vietnam, but this is partly a conventional invasion, but it isn't entirely so. The line between North and South Vietnam is for us, if you will, a wall. For the North Vietnamese, it isn't, I think. You know, they see it as one country. They see it as a partition that's forced on them and that's temporary. It isn't a wall that's permanent. Not only it doesn't have legitimacy, it should, but it can't last. It won't last. So for them, it's not clear. For us, it is. Relatedly, what is here? The balance of interest. And there's ambiguity. You read about what I wrote on balance of interest, what Glenn Snyder, who was one of my professors, wrote. It's not bad, if I say so myself, but it's a little, <laughs> little hard. You don't have to be a quantitativist to say, how are we going to operationalize these things? I say we won in, uh, we convinced Khrushchev to back down in the missile crisis. Yes, we gave concessions, but nevertheless, I think we did largely back down. But, you know, because our stake was greater than his stake, People who disagree say, how do you get that? Aren't you proving that by the result? His stake was pretty great in it, too. After all, Cuba was, in some sense, politically, not geographically, behind the Iron Curtain. He was, you know, he was no longer able to protect Cuba as much. Yeah, how do you know the balance of interest with his was on the American side. And what about different countries' reading of it? This is very squishy. I think that's right. The balance of resolve is even squishier. First, is it the same as the balance of interest? We say, no, it's got a balance of interest component, but it also has a general component of, if you will, national will. But the Nixon shows how hard it is to demonstrate will. One, raise, one way he demonstrated will, as the historians know, is <clears throat> he orders a uh, sack on nuclear alert in the late summer and fall of uh, um, come on, what, uh, a, uh, 69, right? Yeah. And not only doesn't work, the Soviet, the idea is not, you know, the Soviets will pick it up, they'll put pressure, and they'll understand what it's about, they'll put pressure on the North Vietnamese. 
And he said, you know, the orders, we do it in a way that is designed to be only semi-secret. If we did it completely in the open, it wouldn't be good because it would undercut any seriousness. If we did it so well as to disguise, it wouldn't do any good, right? But we did it in a way we were sure the Soviet intelligence would pick up. What happens? The Soviet intelligence doesn't pick it up, right, until the last few days. And then they scratch their heads, and what are they? They attribute it, I forgot to what, but nothing about Vietnam. So, uh, you know, communicating will. These things are difficult, and especially in areas in which that are gray. And Dick Betts argues this partly in the Nuclear Blackmail book. So, yes, extended deterrence is tricky. It's trickier in the post Cold War era because we don't have the main theater of Europe with the line. Um, and our commitment to South Korea and Japan isn't as great, partly because you could say, well, why should the US care about South Korea and Japan? An interesting question. Uh, and especially, how would the North Koreans see it? And we can play this also in the Middle East. So yes, I, I, I agree that the argument that the US extended deterrence is robust because the status quo is uh, clear to everyone and deterrence is easier than compellent doesn't work as well. On the other hand, what weighs on the other side is that we're not talking about mutual second strike capability. So Iran and North Korea are never going to get anything like second strike capability on the U.S. So uh, that makes it me more confident uh, in our extended deterrence. But I agree, even in the Cold War, uh, the arguments, the, the people who argued that American extended deterrence wasn't robust you know, Kissinger made it, Albert Wallstetter made it very much, and why all the people who said why we needed limited options. Uh, I think they were wrong, and they, uh, and I think the Soviets felt they were wrong. And, you know, that's pretty clear, I think, from the documents. But uh, it may have depended on the particular clarity of the status quo, especially in Europe. Um, you know, last week uh, we heard from the Deputy Secretary of State, um, Jim Steinberg, and he made two points. Yeah, I, that, I wish I'd been able to okay. hear him. Well, he, he made two points, uh, you know, in the, the time that he was here, that both of them I thought might pose problems for uh, some of the points that you're making about Iran especially. One was uh, that, you know, even before we got to talking about Iran, you said that I'm not going to talk about non-state actors because that doesn't really fit in my framework. Um, when asked about this, you know, the number two person at the State Department said that if there's one thing that keeps us up at night yeah. and that should keep you up at night, it's the, uh, the, the real danger um, that there are groups that have the intentions and the beginning of capabilities to acquire you know, nuclear weapons. Um, another point, though, that, you know, that um, does go directly to your, your arguments is uh, um, well, you know, after the end of the Cold War, extended deterrence becomes more difficult. You said that you thought we were unduly pessimistic about the U.S. ability to persuade other countries not to develop nuclear weapons, even if Iran does. Um, but his point was that we know with certainty you know, that Saudi Arabia, for instance, would need, uh, feel the need to have nuclear weapons. They don't necessarily have to, he didn't say this, but they don't necessarily have to you know, develop the full apparatus. They could conceivably obtain them from Pakistan. Did, did he say that? Did he, he didn't say, say that? that, no. Well, you're right. I, I wondered if he would say it, no, though. No, right. But, you know, imagine a world in which you have, uh, you know, multiple nuclear powers in the Middle East, none of them, including Israel, with the fully secure second strike capability, unless they change their command and control procedures and so on. So does that worry you? And yeah. would that change in any way your, your feelings about Iran? Yeah, it's a good, good. First on the non-state actors, yes. <clears throat> um, I, I, I think some, the, a lot of the, I think the, some of the worry is exaggerated 
but even a slight worry is worrisome. I mean, the light chance. Um, I don't worry about Iran giving nuclear weapons to Hezbollah or Hamas because I think they know very well it would mean the end of the regime, their regime. I mean, I think if they did it in secret and it wasn't detected, they're, they're safe, but no one gets benefit. If Hezbollah or uh, Hamas used it, uh, I think Israel would destroy uh, Iran. I think Iran would believe that. So, uh, and we can question, and I don't, I'm not, I know very little about this, what is the depth of the Iranian uh, anti-Israeli commitment? But it can't be so deep as to put its own life at risk. So I don't think it would give it. Could Hamas or Hezbollah steal it from Iran? I doubt that. I do worry that if Iran gets nuclear weapons, they will not put in place as quickly as possible all the ancillary things they need. That is the command, the uh, physical security, the literally, you know, the, the locks, the command and control. Presumably, it would be held by the IRGC, not the army. And that's not entirely good news, you know. Would the other leaders realize that, you know, how much you really need to lock the damn stuff up in many ways? And I, I would worry a bit about that. Um, in, <clears throat> on North Korea, the argument is, uh, well, they wouldn't give it, but they might sell it, to which my response is, well, let's just bribe them. I mean, you know, if we think that's what's driving the North Korean regime, why are we doing sanctions? This makes no sense. Uh, and again, I think survival is more, I think they are, we're not going to get sanctions that will push them to the wall. So the selling strikes me as not likely. Uh, you can reply, well, what have they been doing with Myanmar? I don't have a clue. And what have they been doing with Syria? What were they doing? And the Syrian stuff is troublesome. We know very little about that. We, you know, um, uh, even the government knows very little. If you'd asked me before this, we, we Israel bombed the Syrian facility, would North Korea do this? I would have said no. Uh, so I admit this shows I don't understand North Korea. A lot of things would show that. And, uh, uh, I don't think even the U.S. government has a really good understanding of why North Korea did that. So uh, that's not a non-state actor, but it's, it, is, it is troublesome. What about non-state actors getting it on their own? I worry more, I, 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 worry, I think intentions may be, although I've seen debate on that, but capabilities, this isn't easy. I don't think they can do it, and I don't think they're making serious attempts uh, I just think this is really, really hard. Uh, Graham Allison uh, uh, oversells, I think, the danger. And ironically, we owe Graham a great debt because he got on this early, right at the end of the Cold War, the problem of loose nukes. And he really pounded the table, and he convinced a lot of people to take this seriously. And he was right, and they did take it seriously. And now I don't take it seriously. <laughs> uh, but I think he w was right at the beginning. I think he's wrong now. The chapters in John Mueller's book, Atomic Obsession, and his earlier articles, I think are a little exaggerated, but closer to the truth. OK, on, on this, uh, on Iran and the spread, yeah. <clears throat> I don't think it's inevitable if Iran gets nuclear weapons that others will. After all, the countries in the region have lived with an Israeli nuclear weapon. Why can't they live with an Iranian? Which is an interesting question about them and their attitudes. Uh, and partly shows you're worried more about rivals than enemies. Uh, it's hard for them to, to get it. But they are taking moves now that are precautionary. The Gulf states are moving to increase their nuclear capability, and we've seen that. Egypt, I think, are taking small steps. For them to indigenously produce nuclear weapons is extraordinarily long, difficult, and expensive. And 
I, I don't, and I think, I don't think they do it. But what you said is exactly right. I think the fear is greatest in Saudi Arabia. And I don't think Saudi Arabia could produce weapons of its own in any manageable time. Uh, but it is the connection with Pakistan and with China. And of course, Pakistan and China, as we know, have worked together. We know the parentage of the Pakistani, not as centrifuges, but of warheads. See, I mean, there's a large Chinese role here. Uh, would they do it? Would China and Pakistan do it? It's enough to worry about. Yes, I mean, clearly you have to worry about that. Uh, and then do you worry about uh, regional war? You know, would Iran stand to see, idly by and watch the nuclear stuff start to flow into Saudi Arabia? I mean, I'm not sure. No, that is, that is dangerous. The, there is a paradox here, though, which I've called to the attention of my friends in the government and say, yes, it is. But, well, which is to the, our policy of deterring Iran is partly built on saying, look, if Iran gets nuclear weapons, awful things will happen. Saying that somewhat undercuts our extended deterrence. Because it's saying, oh my God, if you get nuclear weapons, we can't protect our allies. Well, if I'm Saudi Arabia, I'm listening to this, I'm, I'm hearing it. So our rhetorical line may be feeding uh, some of these fears. I think if Iran gets nuclear weapons, we would certainly have to do things to reassure the allies. Maybe explicit nuclear you know, promises. I don't think we'd want to station weapons in Saudi Arabia, but there are things I think we could do that would be reassuring to those countries. On the other hand, they might themselves be dangerous and they might not be necessary. I mean, excuse me, they might not be sufficient. <clears throat> so yes, I, I think the point about, if you will, the second order consequences uh, are real. And in addition, by the way, to pointing to uh, Saudi Arabia, the question, what would the Turks do is an interesting uh, interesting question. And uh, so, yes, I really would like to get Iran, if I don't even get them out of the enrichment business, I would like to keep them a year or 18 months away from nuclear weapons. And I think to do that, you have to engage in diplomacy, which for reasons I really don't understand, I think we have not done, uh, just one word and then I'll stop, that, that um, I think we should really take, I think the uh, Iranian counterproposal about doing this, the so-called TRR, the swap deal, in stages was quite reasonable. I think we should have taken that up. I think the Brazil-Turkey uh, deal is reasonable with some conditions, the main one being that Iran cease enriching to 20 percent. I think that's very reasonable and I have argued to my former students who I no longer influence that they should really, that's good, to, it would be good for us. We buy a significant time and see if we can get a deal. And I think that's particularly important because I think there is a potential deal with Iran. I think this administration, unlike the Bush administration, would be willing to get a deal where Iran does some enrichment of LEU in return for not having a lot of stockpiles of LEU and a good inspection regime. I think this administration would do that, whereas the Bush administration would not. I think Iran might well take that because the alternative doesn't look good. They could claim that as a great victory internally, and I think that's what they're focused on. So here is something where I think we might be able to get a deal if we can get things going. So I think here it's a special board, but I think those, uh, and uh, I think it is important to do it. I, I don't want to be blasé about this. I, I think the second order consequences would be great, but I don't think we'll get there. I mean, I think if, uh, I think Israel would attack Natanz, 
before there would be a bomb, so I don't think we're going to get to that. And I don't want to see that world, but I think the second order of things won't arise. Okay. All right. Well, I, I think that's all we have time for. Um, thank you, Bob Jervis. Uh, thank you all for coming. <laughs>